Good afternoon. My name is Robert Esker. I'm the uh, product manager for OpenStack at NetApp. I've been working with uh, OpenStack for about three and a half years, so I've done this a few different times. And I um, thought we'd just go ahead and launch in. We've got a total of about 15 minutes. So I just wanted to give you an overview of NetApp's integration story with OpenStack and uh, a couple other things that we have coming. Do a couple short demos. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead and get into it. So just to get a little bit of the groundwork and the way we think about uh, something like an OpenStack at NetApp, uh, we believe that uh, we have a number of the technologies in place to create a common data fabric across endpoints, whether that be private cloud, public cloud in a hyperscale sense, or of course, uh, hosted private cloud or a number of other boutique service providers. Uh, you know, of course, we're familiar with some of the today's hyperscale providers. Uh, the, your, your, the potential to actually uh, host uh, workloads that might have actually been intended to land at an Amazon or a, you know, perhaps in the future an Azure or a uh, Google Cloud platform. Uh, and of course, most of this is shimmed presently in the form of AWS and OpenStack at any number of different OpenStack equivalents, some of which may in, over time, in fact, achieve some of the same scale that you would see of a, of a, of a Google, of an Azure, and perhaps over time, uh, even an Amazon. <coughs> uh, as I expect most folks are, are already aware here, there are, of course, some high-profile, large public clouds already based on OpenStack, or at least availing OpenStack APIs. And then, of course, a number of other uh, small locales. It becomes that sort of common plane, or at least runtime for infrastructure as a service above uh, that common data fabric that, that NetApp's executing upon. Just, just briefly on the prior slide, uh, our op data on tap operating system is, uh, by most measures, the single most prevalent commercial storage operating system uh, in the world. Uh, of course, NetApp's not the single largest uh, provider of storage, but uh, all of our platforms, with a couple of exceptions, are based on this data on tap. And as such, uh, it's, a, it's a good place to start in building a common data fabric. It's achieve the largest number of nodes possible. Familiar with Metcalfe's law, any given network is only as useful as the number of nodes within, so it's a good place to start. A bit about open source at NetApp. Um, that data on tap I referred to derives from <coughs> uh, BSD originally, and of course we also are the primary employers of uh, some of the Linux maintainers around NFS. So OpenStack was, a lot, was uh, an organic thing for us to, uh, to settle upon. You know, there are a number of different things that NetApp uh, differentiates within the market at large. No intention to go through all of these, but when we start in on something like a, a Cinder integration exercise, uh, we want to make sure none of it is left behind. You know, we're not a commodity storage device. There's a lot of differentiated capabilities, and something like a Cinder is an abstraction. It allows you to write uh, application logic to address a single uh, uh, API for all block storage, but as such, it's an abstraction to make sure that the things that we do differently, whether it's various qualities of data protection or storage efficiency, uptime, availability, protection security, so on and so forth, that those are explicitly accessible through that abstraction. So that's actually where we start when it comes to Cinder development. You know, we've been at this for, like I said, a little while. I've been working with it for three and a half uh, years. Our first integrations debuted in the Essex release, and we've iterated upon it successively, expanded. And in fact, here in Icehouse, we've debuted support for an entirely new platform, namely our E and EF series, an all-flash uh, version of our E-series systems. Uh, clustered on tap is a uh, programmable capability uh, that's resident uh, in many different uh, modalities, many different contexts, whether it be on-prem and a host of private cloud, sitting in front of foreign storage, meaning non-NetApp storage, or increasingly in the future, resident as an endpoint at some of those hyperscale providers I mentioned earlier. So let's actually get into a little bit about OpenStack. And since uh, I'm already uh, talking at length, let me uh, speed along here. Let's talk about uh, Glance. Uh, first thing is, when you backend it on NetApp systems, you get to take advantage of deduplication. Since we are talking about OS bits, uh, deduplication tends to be very aggressive. 90 plus percent is not uncommon. Uh, you could do that with either the object or the file backend, but uh, from a simplicity perspective, file tends to be the, uh, the, the path of least resistance. 
when it comes to object storage, uh, we have an interesting reference architecture on our E-Series platform, which possesses a, uh, I guess you could call it a node level erasure coding capability. It's actually an alternative implementation of the crush algorithm, for those who might be familiar, that allows you to mitigate the effect of long rebuild times classically associated with RAID. Why mention this? Well, you know, e for Swift by default uses a consistent hashing ring. That ring makes three copies by default within a single site, and of course more as you extend over multiple sites. Uh, you wouldn't want to reconstitute over the WAN, so you're talking about at least two copies at the other end of it. Um, you know, a traditional RAID uh, or a traditional parity scheme has those long rebuild times. Since we've mitigated it with our, our dynamic disk pools technology I just talked about, we're able to dramatically reduce the, the actual consumption associated with storage of a single object. So it goes from 3x within a site to 1.3x. Uh, and of course, that single site also becomes immediately consistent. And uh, you, uh, I guess what you ultimately see is a pretty significant reduction in cost of operation. Uh, power cooling, floor space, so on and so forth, management associated. On the topic of block storage, which is of course where we started, uh, goes without saying this is a, a control plane activity. It's not, a, uh, not the data path. Um, one of the things that we work within the community on, and in fact actually there's a session concurrent with this on the topic of the use of volume types within Cinder, you allow you to actually construct a, a, a catalog of capabilities. So I earlier alluded to the fact that our systems do things different than commodity storage, you know, that are different from them. And so how do you get at them? Well, frankly, you, can, you, you establish what's referred to as a volume type. It's arbitrary, arbitrary, and then you compose it with what are referred to as volume type extra specs, which are the unique capabilities that a given Cinder backend can deliver. And so from that, uh, a, a requester of Cinder storage uh, you know, speaks to the API server and then the Cinder scheduler attempts to levy the request against the back end that's most appropriate uh, given the characteristics of what you, of the type that you requested. So just a brief, um, brief demonstration of uh, establishing some, well actually we've already established the extra specs. Uh, this is an indication of some of them that have been established as well as uh, quality of service attributes. And, um, oh I'm sorry, I, uh, I, uh, I moved a little too fast with the fingers there. Uh, what you'll see is that uh, we've established a gold, silver, and a bronze catalog, if you will, uh, with different attributes. Uh, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of option there. In this particular case, we've aligned, for example, bronze to a sort of a lowest common denominator storage option, perhaps it's for ephemeral type use cases where you really don't care about the qualities of the aligned storage. And of course, with a, a silver and a bronze, we've aligned different other things. You probably saw that uh, we assigned quality of service attributes, a, a ceiling associated to a, uh, a given type such that uh, you, uh, you prevent a given tenant from exceeding that. And of course, there's a lot of different reasons why you do so. Um, you, you know, prevent the, uh, the noisy neighbor syndrome, but also, uh, frankly, don't deny yourself as a service provider if that is indeed who you are, uh, the option of, uh, of selling them something that's more aligned to what they're actually consuming. <clears throat> So this is just sort of a depiction of what that looks like with our E-Series driver. And then with our uh, clustered on tap driver, in this case, silver was composed with a, uh, a replication characteristic so that when that occurs, it went ahead and uh, provisioned it into a container that has a replication policy. So there's a number of different options depending upon which of our drivers you use. We avail uh, both NS NFS and iSCSI. We help deliver NFS in the originally within the community, wrote the reference driver for it, the generic driver, if you will. Uh, and you might ask, well, why NFS? After all, we are talking about a block storage service. It's simply vastly more scalable. You run out of initiators and LUNs well before you would files in a given export. Uh, there's a, a variety of cloning advantages as well that I'll get into in a second. But we support parallelized NFS for the first time in Icehouse, uh, by default, if available. And of course, NFS has been around for a little bit on our E-Series systems, iSCSI presently, and you'll, we'll look to expand upon those in uh, the generative time frame. So as, as it applies to, OK, creating new instances in, uh, in OpenStack Compute, uh, most of you may be familiar that a day in the life of a given virtual machine uh, exists as, you know, hey, I'm going to interrogate my fleet of uh, hypervisors and determine what's the, the most appropriate locale given the flavor uh, and the image selected. And, uh, and once I've done so, if the image is not already there, I copy it over. I have to actually curl it over, HTTP copy it to the location, which can be quite expensive. 
Now, it is the case if you have a subsequent, uh, subsequent request, uh, you're going to have the advantage of that one copy cached, but it's only local to that specific hypervisor. Uh, if you have, like I said, a fleet of them, that copy operation occurs on the next one over. And you know, if you have lots and lots of images, this can be particularly expensive. So what we've delivered is a, a capability where it, we can co-locate co Glance and uh, our Cinder backing store on the same system. If it so happens that they are not on the same system, perhaps Swift is elsewhere uh, and is actually the Glance backend and Cinder is on our systems, We'll make that one copy, but that copy actually ends up being global to the entire fleet of hypervisors. And I should also point out that it's a boot from volume activity we're looking at. So it means that your volume, your, your, uh, your uh, bootable volume is, in fact, not ephemeral by default. It's persistent by default. If you have used cases that want an ephemeral instance, then you know, select delete upon terminate. You get the effect. And I'd argue that it's far more effective to go from, uh, from persistent to ephemeral than it is to try to go from ephemeral to persistent, where, where uh, your needs for a given instance to have changed along the path. So it's significantly faster. Uh, we clone aggressively using NetApp's cloning technology. Uh, no, new, uh, no additional space consumed until there's a net new write or overwrite. The effect, is, at least on the storage component of the boot process of new instances, is essentially instantaneous. Not to say that you know, the boot process doesn't proceed and that doesn't take time the storage component of it is dramatically sped. When it comes to uh, the array of storage services within OpenStack, we think there's a critical omission. In 2012, I believe it was IDC specified that something like 65% of all storage sold uh, in the market at large uh, was for deployment of shared file systems. So if you think of OpenStack as the, as the de facto open infrastructure as a service capability, there's a critical omission when it comes to infrastructure as a service. So shared file systems as a service specifically. So we've, uh, we've endeavored to create a new service, uh, building community around it, I should point out, called Manila, uh, which does what for shared and distributed file systems what Cinder does for block storage. If you know what Cinder does, then you know what Manila does. There's some additional considerations for it, and frankly, a little bit of additional complexity, but conceptually, you're there. So uh, this is just a, a depiction of the addition. Uh, a quick uh, demo to show you that this is, in fact, real. On Wednesday, I believe it's at 10 AM, we're going to have a session, uh, an hour-long session that, that uh, is, in fact, actually community activity. Uh, we have a number of other vendors on stage with us uh, demonstrating their capabilities around Manila. It's a, you know, a NetApp conceived of prototype developed, you know, contributed capability. But we are, to be clear, working with the broader community and encourage, uh, encourage folks to join. So you'll see some of those other folks on stage with us on, on Wednesday. Uh, again, not to go into the depth of Manila since we don't have the time here, but it does exist. Those are the horizon interfaces. That's not smoke and mirrors. So it is presently on the path to incubation. We go in front of the technical committee. Uh, well, I don't have the exact date, but sometime uh, after, this, uh, after this summit uh, to get the official nod on it. You can w play with it. You can deploy it today. It's on StackForge. Like I said, on Wednesday, there's a pretty in-depth session. So that's kind of a summary of, of what we've done. I mentioned in Ice House that we debuted a couple of capabilities, support for our E-Series and EF, which is an all-fresh array version thereof, systems in the way of Cinder. That reference architecture I talked about with Swift is, in fact, uh, predicated on e -ser a quality of E-Series underneath. Uh, we default to parallelized NFS where available, meaning the host OS on the compute node, the location of the hypervisor must, of course, support it. Uh, and of course, we'll negotiate it down to whatever version is, in fact, available. I talked about the, uh, the uh, rapid instance creation, efficient creation. We did an additional optimization. We have a capability that copy offloads, where if, in fact, Glance and Cinder are not on the same NetApp systems, we can actually do an out-of-band copy between them directly instead of having to wash it through the, uh, the, uh, the, the host that's uh, running the, uh, the OpenStack services. And then we have a variety of re reference architectures. And uh, our in we endeavor to deliver uh, both Puppet and the future Chef automation with each of our reference architectures. So it's not just a simple exercise in reading it. It's an exercise in making it so. Juno is a whole topic unto itself, but more to come. I've got a limited amount of time. So I uh, just wanted to get into a little bit of some of the reasons why we see folks deploying NetApp uh, underneath OpenStack. I, uh, there's a variety of different ones. One is um, 
I've got a, a variety of cloud native applications. I've got a variety of like classic POSIX applications. And I want to deploy them on a single highly available, highly reliable infrastructure. If I'm only building like that entirely cloud native ephemeral application, uh, then there are reasons why you might do so for, for storage efficiency, the total cost of operation in terms of uh, environmental sustainability perspective. But more often than not, most customers have a collection of both. And to have uh, only one stovepipe infrastructure for one style of application tends to be rather expensive. You know, we see a lot of folks um, uh, you know, kind of moving towards this hybrid cloud model when they want to repatriate from an AWS, when their workloads become more of a steady state and it's frankly too costly to keep it there, or maybe to actually like, uh, you know, deploy it first on-prem and then be able to burst out to. So OpenStack's essential qualities of having essential API compatibility with its equivalent AWS services are attractive in that sense, and I'm running out of time, but a variety of other reasons. So we have a, a number of reference architectures, uh, netapp.com slash OpenStack, uh, more to come. We'll see you in France, hopefully. and. Um, Follow us at OpenStack NetApp, and like I said, net.com sends you to our deployment and operations guide, our communities, some of the reference architectures I discussed, and there's some other sessions uh, this, uh, this, uh, in these ensuing days that are of, uh, of relevance, uh, three of them on Monday, I'm sorry, on Wednesday, and then a few of them other times in the week, uh, including uh, NetApp will feature in the Nebula uh, keynote, and then likewise in the Triple O session where we address uh, NetApp Systems via Ironic. Thanks very much. Run over just a little bit, so I greatly appreciate it. Have a great day.